This is episode 73. This is the business of architecture. Helping architects conquer the world. And here's your host, Enoch Sears. Hello, Architect Nation. I am your host, Enoch Sears. On this show, you're going to discover strategies, tips, and secrets for running a fun, flexible, and profitable architecture practice. So thanks for joining us today. It is great to have you here. Now, to get access to training webinars and other insider-only resources, go over to Business of Architecture and join our insiders list. You'll also want to sign up for the early notification list for the Business of Architecture conference. This is going to be the event this year for solo and small firm architects that want to run a more flexible and profitable firm and have fun doing it. We've got a great lineup of speakers, but only those on the list will get first notice with all the deets. So head on over to businessofarchitecture.com forward slash conference and get on the list. Today's show is underwritten with generous support from BQE Software, the developers of Archie Office. So I just want to thank them for their generous support of the show. For over 10 years, Archie Office has been helping architects run firms that are more flexible, fun, and profitable. So thank you, Archie Office, for empowering business of architecture, and we're glad for all you're doing out there to help architects run a more successful business. Check it out at archieoffice.com. Today's guest is Daniel Willis. Daniel Willis is the author of The Emerald City and other essays on the architectural imagination. He's a professor at Penn State University. So I'd like to welcome you today to the show, Professor, Professor Willis. Uh, welcome back to the Business of Architecture. Okay, thanks. You know, last week we talked about your first four strategies out of seven that are coming from the book The Emerald City and Other Essays on the Architectural Imagination that was uh, published in 1999. And there's a particular essay in there titled Seven Strategies for Making Architecture. And we talked about the first uh, the first four of those strategies. And today I'd like to just finish up and get the the next three strategies. The next one on the list is build it yourself or with friends. And maybe before you answer this question, just give us, in case someone missed the last episode, give us the framework of this because you talked a little bit about how your intention behind this book and this and this essay was a critique. Maybe if you could give us a little background on that also before launching into uh, this this topic. Okay. So uh, as, as I had mentioned in the previous session, um, th- this chapter was, um, grew out of, some other things that are written in the book and other uh, research and reading I had done uh, as I kind of developed a critique of industrialization and um, the industrial sort of the industrialization of architectural practice and building production. Uh, And what I primarily mean by that is uh, that some of the same philosophy and attitudes uh, that are applied to manufacturing after the industrial revolution uh, are applied to architectural practice, and uh, there's increasing pressure to make architectural practice more efficient. And so uh, while I understand the need for efficiency in architectural practice, uh, I am skeptical uh, of efficiency as uh, a sort of as the overwhelming goal of of anything. Uh, I think efficiency is relatively uh, easy to measure and things that are readily and easily measured tend to uh, take on uh, too much importance in our society and things that are difficult to measure like design quality or, um, you know, truth or beauty or wisdom or any of these sort of fuzzy things uh, that are hard to quantify uh, suffer. Uh, And so this, chapter of this essay kind of was, uh, on the one hand, a critique of the sort of industrialized uh, practice of architecture, but on the other hand, uh, was meant to also be realistic strategies for the success of an architect. Like, how could you practice architecture in the late 20th century, the turn of the 21st century? Uh, so I was trying to find realistic ways uh that, that architects could succeed in practice, uh, but um, not sort of the conventional ways that were sort of an industrial logic. Uh, so that's kind of how we got. Excellent. And number five is build it yourself or with friends. So tell us about your thinking behind and insights behind that one. Well, it, in a way, uh, 
you know, these, these are all, there's a lot of overlap. And one of the, the one that we talked about last time, uh, the, the need for collaboration between the parties to the project, the people that are uh, involved in the project. So a big uh, potential source of conflict and an important opportunity for collaboration is between the architect and the builder. So obviously maybe the simplest way to achieve that is they're the same person. Uh, So if, if the, if the two parties are in, in fact one, uh, then uh, it that doesn't mean that the goal of the uh, the architect and the builder are always perfectly aligned. Their 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 uh, goals for the project, but then it then it becomes a kind of internal discussion, or a, a, you know that that the the architect or uh, design builder. Uh, has to try to reconcile any any of those conflicts or trade offs, uh, and uh, so I I do think design build as a strategy has um, has potential to uh, enhance the creativity of the architect or to allow the architect to experiment and do things that they might otherwise not be able to do uh, in the confines of a uh, of a normal practice. Um, you know, I'm not sure who the first person to to mention it, but uh, related to industrialization in uh, product design, uh, you know, people talk about prototyping things. So there's a lot of uh, emphasis on prototype and and uh, someone, uh, some architect, some wise architect said that, you know, in architecture, the building is the prototype. In other words, we build the prototype and we use it and live in it because we it hasn't been possible in our practice to build a full scale mock-up of a building and then build the building. Um, but I think in design build uh, practices where the, the design is really the emphasis, uh, architects do get to experiment a little bit and they get to try things out and they get to uh, uh, maybe fail. Uh, you know, they try something that doesn't work, uh, but they can then correct it. Uh, so I think it does have a, a useful sort of R and D uh, component. Uh, you can you can do some experimentation that you might not be able to do within the confines of a typical construction contract. Um, and as I said, I think it you know uh, it enforces a, a kind of collaboration between the builder and architect because they're the same they're the same entity. Uh, and and then you know building with friends is is similar because when you do things with friends, um, you know you if you uh, hope to have the friendship survive the project, it sort of changes your attitude about the project. You're maybe more willing to compromise, more willing uh, to accept something that wasn't your initial vision. Uh, so I do think uh, I. Uh, the ability to collaborate and compromise is uh, also uh, to some degree valuable uh, and, and, a, and a good strategy for practice. So I, in the book, I mentioned Henry Mercer, who was this eccentric, uh, wealthy uh, gentleman who lived outside of Philadelphia in Doylestown. And he built a couple buildings, including a 44 room mansion and a seven story high museum out of reinforced concrete uh, and he was self-taught as an architect and builder, so he didn't really know how to build with concrete. So he didn't really know that you shouldn't make window mullions out of concrete, but he succeeded in doing it because nobody nobody told him that you shouldn't do it. Uh, and he did. He made furniture out of concrete, uh, and and so it's a it's a you know very quirky, but also you know very uh, creative. His his buildings are uh, extremely novel and creative in their use of concrete, and uh, probably couldn't have been done uh, in any if if he had hired a contractor to build his house, it it would not have come out that way. Uh, so I think this one's important as a way for architects also to just explore and experiment, uh, and I think you can do a little bit of that. You know, uh, Alvaraltos. Uh, studio had a brick wall on the outside of Alto studio where he experimented with all sorts of different brick patterns. And, um, you know, I think, I think that type of experimentation is, is very valuable for architectural practice. 
Are you aware of any architects that are, uh, you know, um, in the cutting edge of this particular strategy, the build it yourself? Anyone out there who's on the innovating in this space that you're aware of? Well, yeah, th I mean, there's, uh, I think, a, a, a number of different levels. There's uh, a New York based firm, Shop, and Shop uh, Architecture has now spun off Shop Construction. And uh, I know they're building a high rise uh, residential building in Brooklyn right now where they're uh, prefabricating the uh, apartments and sort of lifting them up and stacking them. And, uh, you know, that's an attempt to, uh, you know, rethink the way that you would typically construct a high rise building to try to bring the cost down uh, a bit so that maybe middle class people can afford to live in the building. Um, so shop, I think, uh, is, uh, is a firm that's, uh, very inventive and, uh, willing to take chances, uh, and to, um, uh, you know, take on aspects of a project that, that are somewhat risky and somewhat experimental. And they've luckily for the <laughs> success of their firm, they've, they've been able to succeed in almost all uh, of the, uh, of the, of the things that they've done along those lines. Um, so that, that's one. And that's, that's sort of at the larger end. I mean, they're not a, they're not a gigantic firm, but, um, but they're, they're growing. I think they're probably roughly a hundred people in, in their office now. Uh, so it's a, uh, it's a, certainly a firm that can do large projects like the Barclays, uh, center that they, that they did, um, on, on the smaller level, uh, you know, there's a lot of my former students with uh, whom I keep in touch, uh, there's one group of our students that basically does retail spaces and they drive around, they do some anthropology stores and some other um, sort of high end retail spaces, but they basically are this sort of traveling design build crew. They'll move to the city with their, with their van full of tools and they'll, they'll design and outfit a space and they've sort of made a practice out of that. Um, so that's a that's a very small scale version of it um so yeah i think i, I think a lot of uh, architecture firms uh and and architects are uh, are experimenting with different ways to practice yeah, yeah. Uh, everything from digital fabrication to um you know very hands on uh kind of ad hoc almost bricolage approach to to making things in the field do you happen to know the name of that group of students? Do they have a firm name or is it something that you need to look up and get back to me? Um, I think they have a couple different firm names. I believe one is SAW, S-A-A-W. Um, but I'll, I can I can look it up. and, and We'll put uh, that in the show notes. Okay. All right. Number six is theoretical projects, something that I think most architects are are used to. But maybe give me an example of some people you see who are doing these kind of things and what you talk about in this particular part of your article. Um, well, yes. I mean, I, th I think most people are familiar with projects going back to things like Boulay, who did the, uh, you know, gigantic, uh, you know, temple to Isaac Newton. It was the, uh, you know, was a project that he drew, uh, and presented and it became well known, but it wasn't really possible to build a sphere the size, uh, that, that he drew it at that time. So it was clearly a, a, a theoretical project. It was, was not realizable, uh, at the time. Um, so from that point forward, I think that there's always been a kind of strain of architectural practice that is about pushing the boundaries or taking something to uh to an extreme maybe an absurd extreme in some cases but uh to sort of the architect freeing themselves of um the typical contractual relationship with a client or the the need to build the building or or, or any of these things so uh i i believe this is pretty much has existed uh, as long as we've had professional architects. Uh, in When I wrote the book, I talked a, a good bit about John Hadick, who uh, was one of the New York Five and a longtime uh, leader of the architecture school at Cooper Union. 
and he I talked about his mask projects. Um, but I could have talked about, you know, Daniel Liebeskin's early um, drawings that were sort of pseudo proto architecture, but they weren't really buildings. Uh, I could talk about any number of uh, projects. I actually think that um, when you you mentioned the things that have happened since I wrote the book, I think that that theoretical projects, uh, people are still doing them, certainly. Um, I was uh, re recently, you know, looking at some high rise uh, buildings, de uh, designs, and there's some very fancy people are still doing some fanciful uh, ideas for for uh, high rise buildings. So so architects are still doing these. But I actually think architecture, since I wrote the book and particularly in the 2000s uh, and with a lot of the concern for the environment, I think the architecture's taken a a turn architectural practice in the U S and maybe Europe has taken a turn toward a kind of literal and practical side. So, uh, you know, when we wrote this uh, book about architecture and energy, uh, we, we were talking about high performance buildings. And um, I think there's a lot of emphasis now, a lot of pressure to, for architects to, um, to demonstrate to, that their buildings perform in certain ways. So this sort of idea that there's a kind of metric that you can apply and you can show that the building performs. Um, and I, I, I tend to think with the mag, you know, the, um, the print architectural magazines are, are mostly defunct. We, we still have the, uh, you know, web-based and online versions of, of architectural magazines, but, um, you know, there there are things like Dwell and, and Metropolis, but um, I, I don't think there's quite as much interest in the types of theoretical projects that, that like Hadex mask projects now. I think there's, it's more about, everything's about performance. And what I like to point out is performance has a dual nature. Uh, when you talk about performance, you can talk about measurable metrics, but actors perform musicians perform there's also uh an imaginative component a, a, a component of uh of something symbolizing something of performance so performance isn't just about nuts and bolts and quantifiable things performance is also uh, about the sort of performance that you get from a from an actor or a musician and i think that gets lost but i i, I do think you know of all the strategies that this is one I, when I look at the sorts of projects that my students are looking at, they tend to, they tend to be more looking at, you know, real buildings going up in real places, which I, I think is, is healthy and important, but I do, I think we've, I think that the, the, the pure sort of dream project, the, the, the project that isn't really connected to, uh, any particular issue, particularly the, the environmental issues that seem to, to be the most important thing on everyone's mind, um, th that has had an impact. Uh, there are certainly some visionary and futuristic environmental projects too. Uh, and, and, and maybe that's where this is sort of most, uh, most at home or, or, or where that would most be found today. But um, I have to say, I, I, I find the, in general, practice is being sort of very literal and down to earth these days, and and not as not as open to kind of broad rethinking of things. Mm. Interesting. Uh, hey, Architect Nation! It is great to have you listening in today. I want to remind you that this episode of Business of Architecture is sponsored by BQE Software, the developers of Archi Office. ArchiOffice has been powering architecture firms for over 10 years and helping them to be more productive and profitable, which empowers architects to do what you like to do and what you got in this business for in the first place. Create great architecture and spaces. Go check it out at ArchiOffice.com. Now back to our show. Let's see, your strategy number seven would be drawings as demonstrations. Mm -hmm. So that one is a blatant piece of theft from uh, an architectural theorist who unfortunately passed away uh, not too long ago named Marco Frascari. 
Uh, but uh, he had written several articles uh, about drawings as demonstrations. And uh, basically the idea is, and again, this gets back to maybe industrialization and industrial mindset, the way that most people tend to think of the architect's drawings today is there's simply a means to an end, that the, the drawings are a set of instructions for building a building. But historically and throughout the, the history of, of architecture, um, it, the drawing has, has had other uh, uses and, and other goals. And uh, what Frascari pointed out was that uh, a drawing may not be a, a sort of miniature of the building projected onto a, a picture plane, but the drawing could actually show you a quality of the finished building that you hope the building will uh, acquire or in the course of construction. So it, it could be uh, the drawing could show a mood or it could show a kind of character or a kind of, um, uh, you know, it could it could be intent on describing a quality that you hope the building will achieve, but not necessarily tell the builder how to achieve that quality. That So it's almost in a way a little bit like a performance specification as, as opposed to saying this is how you will do it. Say, well, this is what we want. And then now let's figure out how to do it. Uh, one of his examples was that uh, when uh, – ancient sailors used to use maps and charts that he said that every angle that they measured on their map was also an angel. And so that they would use these maps and they would hopefully guide them safely home, but they would also thank the angels for guiding them, the stars. So there, there was always this sort of mythical, you know, kind of imaginative component. It wasn't just about, you know, describing, uh, uh, geometrically uh, describing, you know, uh, part of this, the ocean, but there was also uh, another kind of goal in mind. Mm. So um, really the best thing I could do if anyone, any of your uh, listeners is interested is they should really go find uh, Marco Frascari's books. One's called Monsters of Architecture. It's kind of hard to find because it was a very small uh, run of uh, books, I think in the, uh, around mid 1990s maybe early 1990s but it's called monsters of architecture and um, so he describes this uh, you know the drawing as a demonstration is a way of sort of freeing the architect from um, again it's almost like the theoretical project or uh, you know being a design builder it it um, it it opens up some other opportunities for practice, I mm. guess, a way to, um, way Dude, to uh, you know, and even within my short career of about 10 years, you know, I graduated in 2002. Now it's 2014 as we speak right now. And I've seen a change from the time in those brief 10 years um, in the way drawings are delivered and in the way that um, contractors are expected to read the drawings. I'm giving an example. So, in the past, it seemed like the drawings could be a lot more about the design intent. Today, it seems they're a lot more about every screw, you know, exactly the embedment for every screw. I mean, every, even the building code has gotten to be where they're referencing all of the ASTM standards. And, you know, there's a, it's all formulaic. You know, what's your opinion on, on that whole move towards, is that part of this industrialization where everything's just becoming so structured? Is it killing creativity? I don't think creativity can really be killed. Uh, I, I think that there will always be creative people that uh, find ways out of whatever trap that we, you know, we try to put them in. So, um, but I, I, I share your concern. I do think that, uh, you know, uh, construction documents are getting more and more voluminous. The <laughs> specifications are, uh, more and more detailed the drawings as you said show every screw um there is the attempt and and building information modeling is is doing this um building information modeling is an attempt to create a more detailed more accurate model basically than what we used to do in 2d and 
a lot of the promotion, the the uh, hype, the marketing for BIM uh, talks about it being a perfect digital equivalent of the building or that we will have this, we can eliminate all mistakes. There can be no flaws in the building and we can have this perfect digital model that we can then. So it, it, it sort of goes back to this idea of the prototype. So we can have a digital prototype of the building. We can find all the errors and mistakes in the prototype, and then we can correct them before we actually build the building. And that's a noble goal. Uh, I think, uh, I think BIM does accomplish much of that. Um, but there's a story from the, uh, Argentine fiction writer Borges about a, uh, King that, sent his cartographers and surveyors out to survey his kingdom. And he said he wanted the most accurate map ever made. And uh, that took him two or three years and they came back and the map that they made was so large that they could only spread it out in the courtyard of the castle. And he went and looked at it and he could always say, well, I've been to that town square and the, there's a fountain there and you're not showing the fountain. And I've been here and there's, there's a um, cliff there. and you're... So he kept sending them back out to get more and more detail. And ultimately, they came up with a perfect replica of the kingdom that was exactly the same size as his kingdom. <laughs> uh, I love and that. that story illustrates the fallacy of the idea of building a perfect model of anything, that, that part of the utility of the models we use and the drawings we use is that they are simplifications. They are, they employ abstraction and simplification and therefore uh, we can use them. And if they, if you try to make an exact replica of a building, it would be as complicated as a building and it would probably cost as much to create it as it costs to make the building. So when we do building information modeling, we don't bother to simulate the expansion and contraction of materials due to thermal conditions, right? We don't, we don't do that in the model, but we know that's going to happen in the building. Um, so I, I do think that there, um, so an, an interesting comparison of something that I wrote about in the nineties was, and, and I've never personally been to Japan or observed uh, a construction project in Japan. I was relying heavily on other sources, people that had been in Japan. Um, but uh, they talked about how uh, the architects would have a job trailer at the project site and that how they, um, that the, the pricing documents that they use in Japan are pretty much like our design development drawings. In other words, they're not detailed like you described. They don't show every... Uh, thing and then everything else is worked out during construction. There's a lot of use of mock-ups, and the architects often work late into the night. So there'll be a construction issue identified during the day, and they'll work late into the night at the job trailer to solve it, to come up with a design, so that the next morning when the contractor starts work, the problem has been addressed or the, the the design has been completed and i thought that's an interesting it's a, it's a different attitude which is instead of trying to envision everything in advance that we can actually um you know kind of almost use the actual building as a tool to help us design it mm -hmm. and uh, so it, it and i think it it's in it's a much less litigious society it's a it's a society where um you know that at least according to the things I, I had read, that um, contractors could price buildings accurately based on uh, like design development drawings because they knew each architect and they knew the ten, the, their tendencies, what sort of things that they would add to the building, what sort of detailing that they would want, what their standards were. So they developed these sort of long-term relationships uh, that really eliminated the need for very detailed contract documents. So, yeah, I, I, I think I would be interested in looking at other alternatives because I, I do think the way that we are practicing now is a dead end. It's headed for the dead end of the map that was as big as the kingdom. Mm -hmm. And um, so I, I think at some point we'll need to rethink that approach. Well, perhaps, and if, if that is still the way they do some projects in Japan, perhaps that could be an eighth way of 
uh, making architecture a move to Japan. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, it was probably more attractive idea when I was writing the book than than the trials that their economy has gone through lately. But um, yeah, well said, well said. Yeah. Well, Dan, it's been it's been great having you on the show and, and talking about that. I'd also like to encourage people to, you sent me an article about charrettes, and we didn't get the opportunity to talk about it, but it was a very thought-provoking article, and I'll put a link to that on the um, on the show notes. But basically, you ask the question, are charrettes old school? And then you go through a, little, a very fascinating article. You go through some of the history of charrettes, where they came from, uh, you know, kind of charrettes in academic settings, and then talk about the idea of charrettes and firms and kind of how that affects architecture. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you for pointing people to it. Yeah, you bet. You want to give them just a little hook about, about what you've thought of, uh, discovered in that article? Um, well, I, I guess I, I think that they may still have some relevance uh, that they're uh, it, it's not solely lousy time management that results in, uh, in the, in the charrette, it, it, it would not still exist. Uh, so I think, uh, good project management and good time management has largely eliminated or reduced charrettes in, in architectural practice. And certainly with our students, uh, better time management and maybe a little bit more enlightened attitudes of the faculty, has helped to reduce uh, the pressure on students and, and the need for uh, for all nighters. Uh, but I do think, uh, I guess that my conclusion is the article that that intensive period of of work and focus uh, still may have merit, may, may still have uh, some benefits to the designer, uh, even though uh, it, it has lots of negative uh, aspects as well. All right. Well, thank you very, very much, uh, Professor Dan Willis, Professor of Architecture at Penn State University and a member of the Center for Research on Design and Innovation. And give us really quickly the, the website people can go to to find out more about the school and about your work there. Ooh, uh, so the architecture department at Penn State, uh, if you, uh, it's called the Stuckman School of Architecture. So um, you can link to my uh, faculty page. In fact, I'm in the middle of creating a new one because we're revamping our website. Uh, and we also have uh, uh, a group called um, Arch uh, Website Architecture and Energy uh, that's based on a series of uh, symposia that uh, my colleague Bill Bram and I had, he's at University of Pennsylvania. And we had a grant from the Department of Energy and we hosted three symposia on basically architecture and energy. Uh, and so you can find out about them uh, on that website. And you mentioned the Center for Research and Design and Innovation, which is something I'm also involved in at Penn State, CRDI. They ha we have a website as well. All right. We'll put those in the show notes. Thank okay. you very much for being on The Business of Architecture. It's been great having you. Thank you. And that's a wrap for another show about the business of architecture. To get more resources about how you, as an architect, can run a rewarding business that is both fun, flexible, and profitable, visit businessofarchitecture.com and click the Join button to claim your free account to Business of Architecture Insider. As a member, you'll have access to free tools and resources to help you get more clients, start a new firm, and much more. You'll also get access to my book, Social Media for Architects, where you'll learn how to use Internet tools for fun and for profit. Until next week, this has been The Business of Architecture. The views expressed on the show by my guests do not represent those of the host, and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract, bond, or commitment, except to help you conquer the world. Bump music credit to Ben Folds 5, Do It Anyway.